Nowadays, it's easy to think that you need advanced knowledge of third-party render engines to create beautiful 3D work. But I'd like to show you what's possible using literally out-of-the-box settings in Cinema 4D Standard Renderer and utilizing After Effects to create engaging 3D content. Hey there, I'm Jordan Bergren, freelance motion designer and creative director. I'm here with School of Motion to take a peek at the possibilities of what I'd like to call MoGraph compositing. First, we'll step through some minor prep in rendering out a simple scene in C4D. Then we'll jump over to After Effects, where we'll create an aesthetic that would typically require in-depth knowledge of a 3D render engine. If you'd like to follow along, feel free to download the project files. As a disclaimer, we are using several third-party plugins in After Effects, but I have to say, each of these plugins are very useful tools if you're interested in creating more of this cinematic aesthetic. So, in saying that, let's dive in. So we're over here in Cinema 4D, and I just want to walk through what's happening within the, the project file here for your reference. The, the whole point of this tutorial really isn't about Cinema 4D. It's taking multi-passes and your renders out of Cinema 4D and making them pretty within After Effects. But just to give you a little bit of idea of what is going on within the scene here, if I hit Control R, we're just going to render this out. You'll see we have a completely materialist scene. We do have a simple three-point lighting setup going on here. Where where it's just giving a little bit of form. You know, we've got a nice top light key on the right and then a, a little rim light on the left. Feel free to download the project file if you want to dive into a little bit more of this here. You know, there's nothing too crazy going on that you can't dive in and sort out. Uh, but if we pull the camera out, you can see we kind of have these background cake elements. We've got a left cloth coming in and a right cloth coming in that we'll be using. And then the center element, which includes um, kind of this statue guy crumbling away, as well as some additional crumbles and a spiral piece being sucked in the sphere below. And uh, I do just want to note, we also have some external compositing knolls. We've got one that meets right here um, where our spirals meet our sphere, as well as one that's going to be uh, kind of driving an optical flare lens leak off screen up here. And we'll actually be taking that data into After Effects. But that's a little bit of an overview of what we've got going on. And uh, I'd like to just show you and take a little peek at how we set up this render um, with our multi-passes as well as two different takes for use in After Effects. If we hop up here within our render settings, I would just like to show you what we have going on here on the export out. So this, as you can see, is our full scene, including all the elements. We have background within the foreground. We have our ribbon elements that come in. And then we also have kind of our central piece, which I'm breaking down really into um, one grouping here of the statue, the crumble elements, um, our spiral, and then our sphere. But if you can see in our multi-pass here, we do have ambient occlusion going on. I guess I shouldn't jump across that. That's just a little render adjustment, I guess, including an effect included within our full export. But within the multi-pass, I'm actually sending out an individual pass for shadow, depth, and then four object buffers. For the uninitiated, object buffers are pretty much just a black and white mat that gets sent out when you render from Cinema 4D. So we're able to take that and essentially just use it as a Luma or a Luma inverted mat inside of After Effects. And uh, just so you know how to access these, if you come down to multi-pass, you can add these within here. Um, so you can take a, a dive and a peek through of all the available exports for your multi-passes within standard render. Uh, but just to show you these, you know, shadow, I knew I wanted a little control over some shadows, so we'll be utilizing that. A depth pass is actually essentially a black and white mat that gives you the depth of your scene, and we'll be using that with Frish Lift in post for depth of field and actually creating faux depth of field so that we don't have to rely on Cinema 4D and baking that in. We can have control actually in After Effects of our depth of field. Then we've got our four object buffers here. And as you can see, they're set to group ID one, two, three, and four. Now, what I did was I knew that we would need control over these individual elements. So when I came, if we come over here to our geo, um, I've actually got this compositing tag included. 
And if you come over to Object Buffer, this is where you can essentially line up the indexes of where you would like this object to be included upon our black and white Luma mats within Object Buffers when we export out. And uh, as you can see here, this Cloth01 is actually our left cloth over here, and it has object buffers one and two, which we'll get to. I actually want to be able to utilize this left one independently of this, this right piece here. So what I did was included object buffer one as just our left. And then we've also have object buffer two, which includes both of these ribbons together. If we come down here to cloth 02, which is our right cloth, you can see we're on object buffer two. So when we have that PNG sequence exported out, we actually have both ribbons together to use for other compositing elements and then the left one individually. And I've also included object buffers three and four, essentially our, our crumbles here are on one object buffer and then our sweep is on another object buffer. And that's our little spiral coming down, which initiates our center animation. So here, that gives you an overview of this one setup, the full scene, but I did actually have two different takes here. Now, there's great tutorials out there on takes, but just for a little bit of context, you can think about the whole take system inside of Cinema 4D almost as multiple variations or versions of a single project file. So instead of having an object buffer for our center statue elements here, I decided to put it on its own take. And that's because we've, we're using an effect or a set of effects to do this kind of glass dissolve off or this plasticky dissolve off um, at the beginning of the animation. And I needed him separate so that we didn't have the ribbons cutting in front of him, um, which once we get in After Effects, hopefully you'll get a little better idea of why we had to have him on a separate path because we don't want um, any elements cutting through him. I wanted him on his own. So I essentially sent out another render with no multi-passes, just a PNG sequence with alpha of this second take. Then the final little piece on top actually was coming down to viewport render and exporting out essentially a wireframe that I used just to, uh, as an artistic choice, for lack of a better term, um, for additional little elements to give a little form to the 3D curves and uh, background pieces, you know, our cakes back there. But if we come on back here to our takes, uh, full scene, and I'm going to go to garage shading lines, this is essentially what I exported out as a wireframe. And I'm just going to unselect that. So as you can see here, it's really just a gray, black and white. Um, he's the, the geometry, because this is a value mesher in the middle, is super dense, but I didn't put anything on him. So I wasn't concerned about all these center elements. All I, I really was concerned with are um, these background lines on our cakes and our lines here on our ribbons as well. So that gives you a little bit of an overview of what we have going on within Cinema 4D and the exports. Um, let's hop over to After Effects and jump in to uh, really what this tutorial is all about. All right, to start things off, we're actually looking at the render that we sent out of Cinema 4D. Now, if you remember, we had two takes. This is the full scene. Um, and as you can see, there's no materials. Um, we do have some lighting, but again, this is like no geometry set for anti-aliasing. Like as you can see here up toward the front, our, our volume mesh is super jaggedy. It's just like not what you might consider sexy um, 3D work here. But what we're going to be able to do, and this really is, uh, I, I think, a way for After Effects people in particular, people who really enjoy spending time and spend a lot of time in After Effects, to get some really gorgeous 3D renders from Cinema 4D without being a heavy user of third-party render engines. You know, obviously this is not the route you're going to take if you're looking for hyper-realistic renders, but that's that's completely okay. This has its own place. There's own pro there's certain projects that might call for this type of approach, but hopefully this gives you a little bit of a view on what's possible. So what we're going to do here is actually just walk through the project file with you here. And uh, I'm going to take this composition and bring it onto my monitor on the left. And we're just going to uh, kind of copy paste, rebuild this from the ground up. And uh, one more thing before moving on, this is completely preferential, um, but I like to stay pretty organized within my scene. And as you can 
can see here, here's a full list of our imports for our multi-passes and our renders from Cinema 4D. So we have our full scene render, our depth pass, our object buffer, one, two, three, four, shadow, wireframe, statue. Um, and instead of having these long names, uh, what I typically like to do is just get into our pre-comps and I actually just pre-comp those before using them and then have some more concise names that make them easier to work with. So first things first, I'm grabbing all of our background elements and let's talk through this. So as we can see here, our background is very milky and we still have our center elements here because we are actually using our full scene. And, you know, we don't typically, you know, we don't care about our center elements at the moment. Really, all that I'm looking at is our background here. So if we bring this back down, you can see what we have going on here. And... Um, we really just have our, our full scene render from uh, Cinema 4D. And what I did was I have this kind of background white catch. And I wanted this background to be in this ethereal space where it's a little bit milky, you know, not too much high contrast in these back cakes here. Um, so what I did was just put a kind of four color gradient on here and really kept, you know, just some nice bluish and uh, pinkish tones in here. And that's really the color palette that I'm, I was going for um, was this kind of uh, cyan and fuchsia, uh, very vibrant color tone. So I really toned down the saturation and we kept it in a light spot. And when we brought in our full scene here, um, I actually just started up with some very light touches on our um, on our color palette here. And it's pretty subdued. Um, you know, it's it's all really brought back in saturation. So we just have our our midtones and a little bit higher on the blacks here. But I was able to just add a mask and I did a heavy feather here. Um, and it's just an arbitrary number. But uh, if we look at this and we take this off, you can really see the difference of uh, just a simple mask doing a little bit of uh, some compositing work here for us. So I'm going to go back to add on that. And uh, the next thing that I built up was just a touch of our wireframes here and it's very subtle you can uh, barely tell in the final render but this was just a decision that i made you know we mentioned it before um, just something i wanted to include because i wanted some more form to our geometry here and i figured why not right so i took our wireframe which came out of cinema 4d and just to show you uh, what that looks like you know this is what you get in the viewport right in cinema 4d so we just rendered that out and uh, what i did was essentially just crush the levels and inverted that and actually if i hit f4 um, i went to screen mode and dropped that way back now i just want to throw this out here while we have this opacity up that um, i'm a big fan of kind of aggregated design and aggregated compositing just tiny little elements a lot of tiny little elements very subtle a lot of them you might not even be able to pick up on um, but as you put those together and they aggregate over time you get this uh, result that's just got a little bit more tactile nature to it in my opinion um, than if you just go with uh, you know your baseline rebuilds here so that's just a little note that i would like to throw out which is really kind of something that i take in my philosophy in designing um, in general right so Moving on from that, we have our background color and, uh, you know, really this whole system and setup, this set of techniques is really driven by simple effects within After Effects. You know, it's using tritones, it's using tints, it's using four color gradients with different overlay modes on it. And, you know, especially when you've got a lot of freedom and you don't have to be stuck to a specific brand color, this can be a lot of fun to play with. Um, you know, once you get to the higher level, top level adjustments on these pieces, you can really start getting some very neat, vibrant and textured coloring going on within your renders that quite frankly are just more difficult to get straight out of a third-party render engine so you know pretty straightforward just a simple color if we look at our four color gradients they're just slightly off here but we're keeping within that kind of cyan -y, pinkish world and this green we are on hard light so while this green is super saturated that hard light's starting to take it a little bit more into our cyan -y space so looking at that that's a little deceiving but we're still in this kind of bluish pinkish purplish um, realm here so then on top of that we are very milky back here i just dropped it back and this is actually 
actually, you can see our highlights are just brought down. A lot of these adjustment layers as we build through them might look a little off as we build up. When I built these, a lot of these, I would come back down and do constant adjustments. So you might adjust a layer higher in your hierarchy and then come back down. And of course, one of these was a levels that I dropped in. So out of context, it might seem a little goofy, but uh, we'll start seeing here once we get more of these pieces built in. So that's our background layers. And I'm going to come back over here and grab our center elements. Now, if you remember, our center elements are essentially our center guy, and we also have some crumbles and spirals. Now, I would like to talk just about this. This really isn't the purpose of this tutorial, um, but I've, you know, the, the whole button pushing piece, I'm not going to dive too far into that, but I did just want to show off here. If I hit U on both of these, um, we can see, and I'm... Eh, that'll work. Um, we can see that we kind of have this glassy effect coming on in here. And, um, you know, it, I just started playing with some effects and kind of stumbled on this. And uh, I really enjoyed kind of the effect that it was having. So um, given that this entire thing is arbitrary and really doesn't have a whole lot of meaning that we have to tie it to, I figured why not, right? So just to show you what's going on with that, if we go from the ground up here, we have our statue. And like I said, we're really driving that with tritones. Um, um, you know, all the coloring of this thing. So I want it to be pretty pulled back. You can see in our mid-tones here, which is where it will get a lot of its color. We've just got a hint of this blue because I still kind of like that statuesque look, but it's just picking up as if we're getting some environmental bounce and reflection around. And then our shadows are purple, as you can see within these cracks here and in the uh, in the shadows, of course, that we are just a dark, saturated purple. And again, this just to be kind of an environmental piece and the same thing, we just have some slight saturation on our highlights then um, this is completely uh you know not necessary but what i decided to do was actually put on cc plastic it's just out of the box but um, what's kind of nice about it is we almost get some free specular elements here without having to take the time to render that out in cinema 4d because if you remember we were all texture or material -less within this scene so that's just a nice little touch that i liked within this design gives it a little bit of glossiness. And then within these glass top and bottom, what I wanted was once I discovered this and I played around a little bit, I really like that glass element. And so I kind of figured we could dissolve off, you know, maybe it's melting ice or something, who knows. But what I discovered was we had our tritone that was kind of from our duplicate here. And then I put on this glass and it's, I, I really cranked down the softness and pushed up the height here uh, to get some of this displacement, which was nice. But then I discovered that in CC plastic, there's this cut max. So how we dissolve off here is essentially, as we can see here, it kind of pulls back and I'm gonna take this one off just so we can see a little better. Um, but you can kind of see what's going on here. It's just dissolving off. I would assume it's using some sort of brightness level. Um, I'm not entirely sure about that. I haven't played with it a whole lot. I guess it is using luminance as its property, so that would make sense. Um, but that gives you an idea of what's going on here. Now, this kind of tactic I like to use a lot, right? So we have this one wiping off, which is nice. And what I decided to do was just duplicate this and bring it underneath. And I actually put that to screen and offset it two frames. So now we get this nice kind of highlight piece that's coming off off with that, um, just a, a, an easy little touch that I thought worked out a little better. So now we move into our first area where we're actually using our object buffers or our luma mats. And uh, as you can see here, I'm actually going to use a spiral as an example. This is our spiral element. Now, when we look at our layer names here, this is actually the full scene, right? Because we have all of our elements that we need to use here. And again, the whole purpose of just having these separated out on their own was that I wanted control as I was playing and exploring with these elements on the color. So it's really as simple as this. I'm just going to drop this in just to show you once the, the workflow. I know that I want our full scene within here. And then which one are we going with? Luma spiral. So I'm going to bring down our Luma spiral. And as you can see, it's a black and white mat. So we'll just simply go Luma mat. And just like that, we have full control over this. If I bring in a levels, we can see this a little bit easier. I'm just going to crank up the whites. And as you can see, now we really have this piece and we've got full control. So that you know, super straightforward. We use that time and time again throughout here, but now that just shows you, you know, to a T exactly how that's done. 
So I'm going to go back on our source name here. And uh, that's really an overview here. You know, on the crumbles, we just have our tint um, giving our, our coloration here. And of course, on our spiral, we have the same thing um, that's coming down and, and really just driving that color in there. So we have full control over that should we want to change it up. And now I'm going to copy paste over our ribbon elements. And within our ribbon elements here, we use this exact same technique again. So if we build from the ground up, we have ribbon right, which of course, as we mentioned in Cinema 4D, is actually both of our ribbons here, which we're using for other Luma mats like this guy up here. But I was able to treat that on its own because ultimately our left one comes in right over the top of that. So of course, what I decided to do because we're in this world was get a little bit of that blue tint on the left, a little bit of the, the pinkish purplish on the right. And I essentially, if you look up here, just inverted these two, right? Um, on this right one, our midtones are driving our primary color, but I wanted a touch of that kind of environmental bounce of the blue on the highlight. And I essentially just inverted that idea here. The midtones are, uh, uh, you know, midtone kind of baby blue here. And then our highlights are this very um, uh, kind of unsaturated pinkish. So that we have just that that flip-flop of elements there now this shadows in here honestly is not necessary i gotta throw that out there but when i'm exploring and i'm playing i wanted this piece just to play with if we look at our shadow pass you can actually see that we have got the full scene here but really all i'm using this one for are these shadows in here along the ribbons themselves so this is where that single pass of both ribbons comes in because i'm actually using the luma mat or object buffer number two for both of our ribbons. And uh, it's very subtle, but I was just able to introduce a tint of the blue and white, and we keep that white there because we are multiplying, right? So we would see the rest of uh, that creeping on in if we were to drop our, our brightness or our luminance value on this white. But as you can see, it's just on 30%, and it really, it's super subtle, but I'm okay with that. And uh, possibly there's other places that I could have utilized it, but uh, that gives you an idea of how to use a shadow pass. So we just set to multiply and of course, uh, just one in the ribbon. So that's on a Luma mat for index four at the moment. And then on top of that, that same idea is the wireframe. I really just copy pasted our wireframe from below and uh, set it to a Luma mat with both ribbons on. And it's got the exact same invert levels. I wanted some nice white pieces here. And again, it's very subtle at 14%. You can just barely tell. Um, but I do like that it gives you some more, your brain's able to latch on a little bit more to the form of these elements within 3D space. Uh, so that's the last piece of our ribbon elements. It's pretty straightforward, as you can see. And uh, we will now move on to our 3D data. So we'll copy paste over this and actually we'll get rid of our camera that we brought in just for the time being. So I'm going to go ahead and delete that. And of course we get a little bit of a wonky position. If I hit F4, you can see we have one 3D layer here on the bottom. And now that we have this pasted in, just to look at this, I, I do want to bring this in and show you how easy it is to get 3D data out of Cinema 4D now with Cineware. Um, but first, just to show you what's happening here, um, we've got some color edges that we'll hit on, some optical flares, and those are really the purpose of having our 3D data, the primary purpose right now. Um, of course, the grid that I had mentioned that we'll come around to here in a second. But to show you how this is done, I'm just going to come on top of all this here and come back over to my uh, browser over here. And it's as simple as taking your Cinema 4D file. Now I have it here, but literally just go to your file browser on your computer and I just dragged and dropped the actual project file in here. Now what we're able to do is treat this like a layer itself. And uh, you can go out and learn a lot about Cineware. They're really trying to do some cool things with integrating in um, Cinema 4D's render engine within After Effects. But in this situation, all I care about inside of Cineware here is this command down here of extract. Now, you can get a ton of data from your C4D file here, um, but I'm just going to go ahead and focus in, narrow in on this guy. So we have got extract and look at that just like that. We have got our three lights within the scene. 
we have got our camera, which I've hit you. You can see that it's baked down with our animation that actually comes from Cinema 4D. And then most importantly to our scene, we have two nulls here. We have our center light null and we have our upper right null, which is essentially the position for our light leak. Now, the nice part about that is that within optical flares, we don't have to do, or even any 3D element, there's no animation required. We can just let this do the heavy lifting of being positioned on screen, right? So it's just a very simple way of being able to start integrating in that 3D space into your After Effects project file here. So I'm now that we've seen that, I'm just going to um, delete all of these, which I should say before we do that, once I had this 3D data, I just got rid of this Cineware. You don't need it anymore. You have your data inside there it lives independently now so just want to throw that out there as a little note i hope you're digging the tutorial so far and if you really want to learn cinema 4d check out cinema 4d base camp which is part of the school of motion core curriculum if you're already comfortable in cinema 4d and want to take your 3d skills to that next level check out cinema 4d ascent which will teach you the advanced 3d techniques that will make your work stand out links are in the description all right, on we go. So coming back into here, we're going to just take a peek at this. And um, as I mentioned, we have this color edges going on. If I were to remove this, you'll see that it's actually just lightening it up. It's almost like the inverse of a, um, uh, a vignette in a way. Instead of darkening the edges, I'm actually just introducing some more of this milkiness. And the whole purpose again for this is just to put this scene within this space, this more ethereal space where we lose some definition along the edges. Um, it's kind of in a little bit more of a dreamlike spot. And uh, uh, what we did here is if I hit F4, this entire layer is on a screen. And I, of course, have another tried and true four color gradient, some arbitrary colors that fall within our color palette, some blues, uh, cyan, -y, fuchsia purples, just slightly moved around and um, our, our positioning's just a little bit off, but set that to screen and just dropped it back to about 80%. And that, to me, it does a nice job of just putting us in this state that we want. Now, of course, uh, go check out Optical Flares if you have not spent time with this. To me, this is still one of my favorite plugins to use um, in the most subtle way. Uh, just because of how much heavy work it's doing and how many options you have. Um, so I won't dive too far into that, but just to give you a little bit of an overview, we do have this light here, an A light and a B light. And we actually named those and parented them to our 3D nulls that we brought in from Cinema 4D. And uh, that allows us just to have our center actually attached to the center here um, once we come through. And of course, we have our track lights on and name starts with A. So our center light is picking up on our A light here. And then the same thing, which is a slightly different optical flare with a different set of tints here. I believe the center was a little bit of our blue. Our top is the inverse of that within our color palette to that pinkish territory. And that's picking up on the B light for our, our light leak up here, which I really, really like that. You know, these are the type of light leaks I like where it just kind of washes out a little bit. We can tell we've got a, a little bit of a light source coming up here. Um, it might not be exact, you know, technically it should be up here, but I'm okay with that. I think it still plays well. So of course the camera and the last piece here is it's kind of hard to tell, but we have this grid front and I'm actually going to bring in our grid back from our other piece here. And that falls down below the statue. And these elements are one of those things that, again, just small aggregation of detail. Uh, it's so subtle, you might not even notice it in the final render. But our grid front here is actually, if we hit position, um, you know, in Z space, the center null or our center object is on zero. So I went negative 200. So essentially, these little boxes right here are set in the front of our grid. Um, I'm sorry, in a Z space and set in front of our center element. And then the grid in the back, if we hit position, is moved back 200 pixels to go behind this. Now, of course, because not all of this is actual 3D work, we do still need to take into account that I wanted these grid back pieces not to be in front of our center element and our ribbons. So just a heads up, you know, when you still are driving a lot of your 3D 
passes in 2D space here and uh, separating them with luma mats, you still need to respect the hierarchy for um, what's drawn on top of uh, what layer. So that's why this grid back is back here. If this was all 3D, you wouldn't have to worry about that. It would actually be rendering behind or in its respective position on Z. Um, but I think uh, this should uh, hopefully give you an idea of, of how to handle that kind of thing. So just tiny little grids. And when we look at this, the purpose of this wasn't to be a design element so much as I just needed something else. You know, overall, this is a relatively flat scene. You know, we don't have much in the foreground giving us separation or anything, which is something we address later on. But these grid uh, elements were just a way to give the eye a little bit more parallax and something to latch onto to give us some more 3D depth as we have this pull out and this crash in, right? So very subtle elements, a uh, good example of how you don't have to be heavy handed with a lot. Um, it's just picking up on tiny visual cues that your brain can latch onto. Now for our final elements on what we'll call our primary footage here, I'm going to copy paste and drop in our top level adjustments. This is something I do with all of my work um, and it's looking a little blurry right now. We're going to fix that. But um, just as a high level, you know, really, especially when you're doing these 3D pieces and compositing individual elements together, having these layers on top that kind of mold and shape and, and bring everything together really goes a long way. Um, you know, it's something that I like using a lot, especially once you get a lot of these colors that are set to varying opacities, um, putting pieces on top can really pull it all together so it goes a long way. Um, but before we dive in this, I'm going to just show you one element we need to address here. And uh, I, I guess I could just step through. Well, turn these off for now and uh, as you can see it's really blurry right now and that's because of our fresh lift depth of field now this is where our depth pass comes in so if we come back over here and i'm going to go up to our pre-comps um, if you remember we actually have our depth pass and uh, just to take a peek at that again it's just a black and white mask and you're essentially saying somewhere along this scale of black to white and luminance whichever color of gray or luminosity you choose will be in focus so it's a way to take care of your focus in post right so what we need to do is use this as a reference point so i'm going to take this depth mat and i'm just going to place it behind everything so that we don't have to see it and you know we will use this essentially within frish lift so if we come up here go into frish lift you will see that we have got a depth layer right now it's set to none so what that's doing is essentially just blurring the entire thing as if you had a fast box or a gaussian blur or something of the sort but what we're going to do is actually come down here and set our source or a depth layer to that mat and what's that that's done is hopefully we can see here i might toss on the levels just to give us a little more contrast um but it's really blurring now so we're pumped way up here just so you can see um but we're really blurred and if we just play with the focal point here hopefully we can see it within this that we're able to start doing some depth of field pieces within this so you still have control over being able to animate that everything else um, but it's a super slick tool i really enjoy fresh lift in their products so i'm going to undo that we're back to 157 and i'm just going to drop this way back let's just go back to four um you know i just wanted it to be slightly soft back here we don't lose all of our detail within that wireframe um, it just gives us a slight sense of separation here so we do have that going on and then cc lens out of the box this is just one of those things which will also get some from chromatic aberration here but if you notice on the edges when we apply a cc lens out of the box it is this crazy warp i really like using this for 3d scenes if we crank the size all the way up to 500 you'll notice we're almost just kind of inverse spherizing this piece a little bit the edges come out and it's a super subtle effect but what i like about it is on this piece the camera's not terribly dynamic but we just have this pull out on z and uh it just makes the edges move a little bit faster you know it's a, a to me it just adds just a slight sense of lens realism especially knowing that we're um, on a super wide lens starting out so it's really a subtle thing completely preferential but one of those things that i really enjoy using a lot um, is one of those subtle elements that i'm uh, building up on 
So that gives you a look at our lens adjust and we've got next our chromatic aberration. And this is another one of our third party plugins that we're using and it is universe, it's red giants, universe chromatic aberration. I messed with some settings here, um, just slight touch down on the distortion amount. I got rid of some of the um, edge blur, the radial blur that we have here. There's just a slight amount, but ultimately what chromatic aberration is all about is the shifting of channels. And the thing that I like about this plugin is, you know, I used to pre comp my entire scene and change one pre-comp to a red channel, one pre-comp to a blue, one pre-comp to a green, and then offset on X and Y slightly by a couple pixels. And the thing that's nice about this is it actually treats it a little bit more like a lens might, like a physical lens might. So if you look up here on this ribbon in particular, if we turn this off, you can see what's going on. We're having a shift in those channels and we can see what those channels are by spinning open the channel here, red distortion, green, blue, and actually have control over that. But uh, just, you know, for, for your own sake, I, I just left these at their, you know, out of the box uh, settings here. So really just toned down quite a bit up here. And uh, I really like that touch. It's just a very subtle one. So, of course, we have a vignette around the edges, and I actually brought that up a little bit because I wanted it to be darker down here. If we look at our mask, I usually keep my vignettes around 350 to 400, depending on the scene. Um, but, you know, a nice little tip that I've picked up is uh, don't keep it just a standard ellipse tool. Uh, get a little bit of variation in there. And, of course, because we have our highlight or our lens leak up here in the right, I was able to move it up since we're dropping our midtones, and it just kind of comes around. So just something to play with. Very easy one to put on top. And uh, I'm a big fan of very subtle vignettes. And before moving on, I do just want to say I know a lot of people like to drop back for their vignettes on the highlights. You can do that, and I don't think that looks bad. Um, I'm typically a fan of just dropping back the midtones. Uh, it's a little more photo accurate. That's not always true depending on the camera size and the frame sensor size and everything it can really drop off to black on the outside but that's just my preference you know so just a drop on the mid-tones a little bit is something that i really like and the last piece that i'd like to speak to on this top level adjustments is our LUT. And LUT stands up for lookup table and has been used for years, actually started back in the film world where um, essentially it's a way for color artists um, to look at a color of a, uh, I guess it wouldn't be a pixel, but to look at a color and translate that color to another color. So there's a ton of LUTs out there and it's actually gained a lot of traction within the 3D community. The 3D community uses LUTs all the time now, um, but I actually know them from my time in the live action world um, doing production and using LUTs actually within a production environment for live action. And I've got a couple old ones that I use, but really it's pretty straightforward. You come over here, type in LUT, you drop it in, and then it just gives you a place to uh, a box to pop up to go searching for your LUT. And I've got one of these old ones that I like to use um, from many years back. But uh, if we look at here, I do just want to say with a majority of LUTs out there, they intentionally make them very strong. Right. So if we look at our LUT out of the box here at 100 percent, it is a ton. And you'll see in apply color LUT, there's no actual options there other than choosing the LUT that you'd like to use. So what I like to do is really drop those back. And even there's sometimes where I'll pile up a couple different LUTs. Again, just very subtle layers at 10 percent, 20 percent, 30 percent. And it's not necessary. You know, there's more efficient ways to do it for sure. But I really enjoy it because it can do some heavy lifting and lead to spaces and places that you wouldn't be picking or going into otherwise just doing a standard color picker. So just one of those things that I enjoy doing that I think us 2D people could utilize a little bit more when we don't have brand colors to adhere to or brand guidelines to adhere to. So I'm going to control Z that, get it back to 30%. And that gives you a look at our top level adjustments. You know, as I mentioned, I now consider this our single piece of footage. And on top of that, as I was going through here, it's really just feeling a little flat to me. You know, again, there's not much going on within the foreground. There's no motion blur. So we've got these crazy fast, you know, crash zoom at the end and a, uh, uh, a pull out at the beginning. And uh, uh, so I wanted to be able to address some of those elements. And another one of the big ones was because there was no foreground elements, it felt a little flat. With our graphic elements here, I'm not going to dive in a whole lot to the design idea here, but, um, you know, I put these together, decided to ground it in school of motion and uh, symmetry. So 0, 1, 10, why not? But I've got those animated. As you can see, I really, you know, 
the animation timing and the beats of your animation that you come through on this. Um, I knew we've got essentially our first actions camera pull out, second is snap in, third is settle, and fourth is crash zoom in. So what I wanted to do is actually tie this animation together so that we've got supporting elements on one another. So what I what I had was on this kind of snap in on our ribbons was when I thought we could initiate this graphic element coming outward. Now, if I come down here, you can see I've got this on Luma map, but actually when I was designing, I originally had it like this. And this is where separating out that left, that left ribbon from our Cinema 4D render comes into play. Because when I first had this, it just felt a little flat. You know, it really did feel like we're just slapping graphics on top of footage. And I really wanted to be integrated in. Like I mentioned, this relatively flat feeling scene at the moment. I wanted more depth. So a really easy way that I was able to accomplish that was just bring in our Luma left ribbon and we just use that as a Luma inverted. So it seems as though even though if I hit F4, we, none of these are in 3D space. Um, it just again gives the eye something to grab onto to set us within this 3D space so that our graphic elements are tied to our composition, our primary 3D render here a little bit. Uh, very subtle thing, super easy to do, but definitely something you should consider within your scenes if you're doing this kind of 2D meets 3D um, type aesthetic, you know? So those pieces are there. That gives you a look and uh, just if you wanna take a look at what's going on with the animation, um, we've got essentially our expand out, settle, and then we have the final expand outward if you look at the blue box in the center. And uh, maybe we can drop this back so that it's a little more responsive. I don't know if that'll help. Eh, not much, but you get the idea, right? Push out, settle, and then snap back outward. And for another elements here, like I mentioned uh, previously, we do have these pieces and we'll copy paste these in. And again, when I was looking at this composition, um, it just felt flat, you know, I'm going to go back to full resolution here. It just felt flat. I just wanted something a little more dynamic. So I figured I'd pick up on this, this element here, which is essentially just set at 45 degrees, um, which works well, you know, keep everything. We've got 90 degree angles everywhere, everywhere else, cut it in half. And I actually just took these corner transforms and essentially set them to a cover. And if we look at what's going on with our covers, we're just using those as alpha mats. And uh, they're essentially, I'm going to hit you, they're essentially just expanding outward just slightly before to anticipate um, our graphic elements here. Um, but we're just expanding out where uh, we're, we're scaling up on Y because we've got it rotated and then we're moving on X here to push out. Now, when I'd, I'd first done this, I had our corner transform on both sides, which is really just the transform effect scaled up 22% uh, from 100 to 122, and it just gives a nice offset. And when I had that on the other side, it just it didn't quite feel flat. So what I decided to do was actually just toss on uh, fast box blur. Um, you know, most people overlook the fast box blur, but it is so handy for less computing power, especially with something like this, where you just want to blow the thing out. And I really like the colors that get molded and mended there. You know, I really enjoy that kind of thing. Then just as a little design tip, you know, once we have come to our full lockup here, I decided, um, uh, they're expanding outward, but I decided to kind of ground them across the 10 and the one here so that uh, we've got kind of some connecting reference point to everything else. So that's just a little side design um, mentality piece to use. I'm not quite sure the right word for that. So that gives you a look at that. Really, this, this shows you the full piece being built here, but the last couple elements that we've got within our main comp here are the final icing on the cake and it's very subtle um, but if we look here again I mentioned we did not bake in motion blur you know I wanted to keep it all standard out of cinema 4d so with our motion blur what I decided to do was there's no point in sending out a different pass and getting fancy with it really we've got a simple camera move pull out push in so what I did was I just dropped on a radial blur set it to centered zoom and uh, that gives you a nice faux motion blur coming in and out. And I kind of matched our curves here with the curves of um, our camera animation here, where we kind of have a standard ease in and then a heavy ease out. 
And then of course, just the crash zoom back out really pushes it further as well. And uh, the final piece here, you know, again, arbitrary, whether you need it or not, but I've got universe grain going on here. You can also use the out of the box grain for, for after effects, but it is a little bit heavier on your render time. So that's just something to be considered. So that last grain piece is just to tie it together. But, um, you know, it's just a nice touch on top to uh, unify a little bit. So I did just want to throw in a tiny little bonus feature here. And um, really, this is 100% not necessary. But for those projects where you're either doing personal work or maybe you have a lot of creative freedom with a client project um, and you're looking to explore, uh, one thing to keep in mind is, we thought we had a done piece before, but if you notice here, I actually was just playing around just for fun, um, really no purpose. And we end up getting this nice textury bit, which I'd stumbled into. And uh, what I what I have here is just a full pre-comp piece of the piece that we just built. And I took that and I started looking around at some other effects within the Red Giant universe. And I found this great piece of texturized motion. And essentially what that's doing is just, it's kind of cycling through a pre-baked texture and I'm going to go down here and get rid of my fast box fast box blur and it's cycling through that and then it's also posterizing the source the the actual source image which would in this case be the animation we just got done now typically without having this on screen and uh, of course the the opacity is off a little bit that's a little bit much but just something for you to consider that there's so many fun things that you can be adding in if you think about it more holistically as a final piece or even as a single piece of footage itself you know you don't just have to cap yourself um at the point where it's like okay in this composition i have reached my limit you know i'm i'm okay where it's, where it's at um and uh, just to give you a little overview here of what's going on really we've got this piece which I've essentially screened. And I really liked what was going on within this first section. Like right there, I loved how there was just kind of this polygonal thing going on, even though it's, if you were to go frame by frame, you can tell it's paper. My brain right off the bat was kind of like, oh, that's this nice, cool textury thing that's happening. And then we settle in. And I actually animated the opacity and set it to screen here because it was just too strong in the middle. I wanted this moment of a little bit more visual silence here as we slowed down before we have our straight kick out here, which is not fully rendered yet, um, in which it comes storming back in, right? So essentially we start off at like 90% opacity, drop back. And then again, I didn't want it to be apparent that it was paper because there's nothing in this that's saying collage, you know, there's nothing speaking to that. Um, but it did kind of fool my brain. So I just tossed on a fast box blur uh, just to soften it a little bit so that you couldn't tell quite as much and um, actually set so that the posterized source time is off and it's on here. Because if you notice ever so slightly, if you look at this one or the 10, you can kind of see these little strobe effects of the leave behinds, right? And even that with your brain, it's so hard to pick up, but it just adds this nice, super subtle uh, touch to that middle section that gives it a little bit more tactile feel um, to the animation, the aesthetic overall. Um, so it really just turns back on here. And just so you know, the reason I pulled it off here was with this dr dramatic quick snap out pull here that posterized time was leaving this big white mass here trailing behind so i had to kind of get rid of that there and just keep it here for the subtlety so again something to check out just to keep in your mind that you can always play with these things and honestly i could have gone another you know half full afternoon playing with this because there's so many different things that you can try out when you're approaching this from the perspective of a single piece of footage, even though you just got done comping together an entirely bespoke piece in itself. I hope this video opened up your eyes to what's possible in using both Cinema 4D and After Effects and how far you can push a simple clay render. If you like this video, we would appreciate a thumbs up. Also, make sure you subscribe and hit the bell button to get notified when we release our next tutorials. But in the meantime, feel free to reach out to me directly. I'm always happy to talk shop and answer any questions. Thank you so much for watching.